like to thank the organizers for the opportunity uh, for uh, me to be able to speak about my lab's uh, efforts for uh, novel drugs for autism spectrum disorder. So uh, the pro I just take one slide to define the problem. I think many people are familiar with the, the issues uh, surrounding autism spectrum disorders. That is that the uh, autism and related disorders are costly and very difficult to treat. So unlike most medical uh, issues, uh, uh, psychiatric disorders are defined principally by uh, or exclusively by abnormalities in behavior. So no diagnostic medical test can be used. So a, a professional has to see a collection of abnormal behaviors and, and then based on that will give you a diagnosis of autism. And as you'll see, that that's probably one of the reasons why it's difficult to translate uh, uh, in the autism space. So the prevalence is, uh, seems to be going up every year. It's now uh, down uh, or up to 1 in 59 live births in the USA. It's four times more prevalent in males uh, relative to females. So the male autism rate is now uh, around 1 in 37 uh, live births. The cost of society is enormous. Current estimates are in the $200 billion in the US uh, annually, and that's expected to double over the next decade. Uh, when that's paired with the fact that there's no real disease-altering therapies, you can see that this is a tremendous uh, issue for our country, both uh, you know, socially, socially uh, and in ep uh, economically, uh, because it's only expected to continue to get worse uh, as it goes on. And unfortunately, there have been some high-profile clinical trial failures lately. And, um, and one of the reasons why uh, many people think that this has happened is that you have to take a step back and ask yourself, well, what actually causes autism? So when you define disorders based on behavior, uh, really what you have is a very heterogeneous disorder where, and maybe there's many types of autisms, and when you collect patients together, maybe what you're looking at are patients with different ideologies. And in fact, that's essentially been proven because now we know the number one risk factor for developing autism and related disorders uh, are uh, genes and genetic variation. In fact, uh, uh, most types of autisms uh, are caused by complex, what are con is a complex genetic disorder, meaning there are many risk factors that, uh, of low effect that uh, combine in the patient to cause a disorder. However, 10% uh, of uh, autism cases uh, uh, can be explained um, by a single gene. Uh, and in fact, these, this 10% of single gene, so essentially 10% of all autisms are single gene disorders. Different single gene disorders, but single gene disorders nonetheless. And 50% of these can be defined by loss of function genes or loss of function variants, which are uh, as important because those are more straightforward to translate. So this is a meta, 10 years uh, and 100,000, more than 100,000 autism patients have been sequenced. And what this has led to is uh, now a chart uh, or the information of these single genes that cause autism. So if you look at the bottom here, these uh, are the most common genes that cause uh, single gene forms of autism. And these genes uh, down here uh, are affected by loss of function variants. So what this does is it creates a tremendous opportunity to translate because these loss of function variants, uh, essentially the disease, disease mechanism is low protein expression in brain cells. So that gives us a defined way to try to target these single gene forms. So essentially when you have a loss of function variant, what happens is one allele uh, typically uh, will be inactivated and you'll lose half of your functional mRNA. And what this results in is uh, a, re a reduction in protein that's made within brain cells. So the strategy uh, uh, is simply uh, to develop drug candidates that raise protein levels back to, 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 uh, to normal in brain cells. Okay, so that's basically the strategy of our lab. So the way we're doing this is we're doing proof, proof of principle studies in one single gene form uh, type of autism in what's called SYNGAP1 haploinsufficiency. We do this because I studied this gene for a very long time before it was an autism gene. But almost overnight, my lab became translational because this, this turns out to be one of the most common genes, uh, most recurrently mutated gene in autism. And as you can see, this is just a map of some of the variants in autism, and they're all essentially loss of function variations. So these kids have half syngap protein in their brain cells. And the clinical presentation is important as this is not that this is just a few cases. Uh, it's thought that SYNGAP1 can account for uh, anywhere between half to 1% of all autism cases, which would be tens of thousands of patients in the U.S. And these kids have uh, not only autism, but they have a complex disorder uh, defined by autistic traits as well as uh, intellectual impairments uh, uh, and uh, medically intractable epilepsy. I'm also, uh, I've been, I've been uh, uh, helpful in, uh, along with Parent Advocacy Foundation uh, to create a patient registry. So not only do we study the biology of this disorder and try to translate, but we're also um, uh, um, collecting uh, patients in the registry to be able to perform uh, clinical trials in the future. So what my lab has been doing over the last decade is having a three-pronged approach to try to translate uh, in the SYNGAP1 space, but the tools that we're creating in theory can be, we're to develop them in such a way that we can plug in any single gene cause of autism. 
and that is to do is is to pair or marry drug drug cannabis discovery along with uh, uh, humanized uh, uh, animal models to understand the biology and to also develop uh, effective secondary assays uh, to validate uh, um, drug candidates. And also more recently, uh, we've, made some, we've had some success in developing human neuron models of, of these single gene disorders. This is just an example of, of the effectiveness of our, one of our humanized animal models. Through our work with the patient registry, we found an interesting uh, uh, brain phenotype in, in children with SYNGAP1 disorders. So we found that when SYNGAP kids go to sleep, they uh, suddenly have very, uh, very abnormal brain waves that occur uh, uh, as they fall asleep. And this is very unusual in kids with epilepsy and autism as it tends to be kind of generally interspersed. We found when we humanized an animal model, we put a SYNGAP1 variant in the human, human animal model, in the humanized animal model, we found essentially the same thing. When the animals go to sleep, you see this uh, increase in this abnormal brainwave activity. However, when we, uh, in this animal model, we have the ability to just reactivate this broken SYNGAP1 allele. So we can uh, genetically reactivate and raise protein expression. This is the same animal, and you see these abnormal brainwaves go away. So we know that we have proof of principle in this humanized animal model that if we can raise SYNGAP protein back up, that we can fix a, a, a clinically relevant uh, uh, brain abnormality. More recently, we've been uh, moving into human uh, uh, neuron models of SYNGAP1 deficiency. And here what we show is, is that the major theory of autism is that what all these different genetic variants do is to affect the communication between brain cells. And the way brain cells communicate is, uh, are through synaptic connections. And we had found years ago that when we made this humanized animal model, that individual synaptic connections will, can be seen by these little blips here. In the humanized uh, uh, SYNGAP animal model, all of these synaptic connections seem to be stronger. And that means that the brain uh, communicates information. Uh, the gain on the brain is turned up, and this can affect uh, not only epilepsy, but can affect thought uh, and behavior. We recently developed, uh, uh, we took uh, blood cells from SYNGAP1 patients, uh, re-derived them into iPSCs, and now we make human neurons that have these patient mutations where there's low SYNGAP expression. And we see exactly the same phenotype in these synaptic connections. So that tells us that the there's a conserved function of this gene and protein across species, and now we have effective uh, not only animal models, but we think also uh, human models to be able to not only understand the biology, um, but to validate uh, probes that we might see. In the last few minutes, I'm going to tell you about our ongoing efforts to try to perform drug discovery. Now, um, Scripps, uh, both in Florida campus and here at Caliber, um, we have, uh, you know, uh, 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 we set the standard for academic screening centers. So we have the uh, uh, you know, industry level uh, mechanized and automated ways to perform high throughput screening. And uh, as has been mentioned before, is that we have access, uh, even younger investigators have access to this. So the moment I've come to Scripps, I've been dreaming about finding uh, compounds that raise SYNGAP1 expression. So, so that's exactly what I've done. And I've convinced the, uh, Tim, Tim uh, uh, Spicer and Louis Gambavia, who direct the core at Scripps, Florida, that, that we should do this. However, and I want to make assays that can track in a, in a disease background, a relevant disease background. I want to find that magic bullet compound that can raise SYNGAP protein back up. However, what Tim and Lewis told me is that they can't do this in, in brain cells. So, uh, and this is important for two reasons. One, brain cells, we want to have the most disease relevant assay. That would be brain cells. I mean, this is the low SYNGAP expression or low disease gene expression in brain cells. Uh, and also, the SYNGAP1 gene is only expressed in brain cells. So we, if we wanted to use another type of cell, we would have to uh, uh, exogenously express it. So what I can say is over the last seven years, we've now been able to, to make assays in the lab, miniaturize them, and perform screening in primary neurons uh, in a completely automated way using the high-throughput screening. We recently uh, performed a screen of, uh, of over 100,000 assay wells for synaptogenesis uh, uh, in the Scripps Florida uh, screening core. I can tell you that now we've created, using um, uh, improved technology for tracking protein expression uh, in any live cell, we now believe that we've cracked the scalability issue for primary neuron screening, and we believe that now we can screen uh, 200,000 unique compounds, uh, which should, should give us, uh, after uh, validation, we think 20 uh, validated hits that we think we can move forward with uh, to, to raise protein uh, SYNGAP. So the timeline for this is that uh, we're excited to start doing this. We think we're going to start screening in the first half of 2020. Uh, validated probes should happen about a year later, and, uh, and then we, ex we expect to expand into other single gene ASDs uh, in 2020 and beyond. And I would like to thank uh, uh, collaborators and also the, uh, the funding agencies. Thank you.